Аз съм Владислав Шаплодина, английско мога да кажа, да през своите презентации представляте. Адолесенс е един период между началото и адолесенството, и това е една много голяма ранга от хронологична възраст. Това е една втора декада от живота, и началото на пуберта е само в фемиалите 8 и в мъжете 9. years, so the beginning is really important. These are critical years as many processes during the pre-puberty, before puberty are much more important than later on. So it's an accumulation, accumulation of the uh, structural material for the body and skeleton in particular. Uh, growth spurt which occurs during puberty is usually 12 years and approximately 13-14 years in girls and boys respectively. And of course girls maturate much earlier than boys, approximately, approximately two years earlier. During this rapid growth, a skeletal accumulation of the mineral occurs and this is a dynamic process that consequently leads to the achievement of peak bone mass and certainly it remains under the control of vitamin D. So vitamin D, the role of vitamin D it's calcemic, skeletal action is very, very, uh, very high and there is much evidence that we need vitamin during growth. Well, in this live course line, we all know perfectly that vitamin D is necessary for preventing rickets and there's also, there's a large body of evidence that the vitamin D is preventing falls, fractures, fragility fractures during postmenopausal osteoporosis. However, the question arises, what about the mid-ages in young adults and puberty? What's the status and what are our needs during the early growth? Well, puberty is considered the critical stage. These are critical years in the development um, as the skeleton is growing permanently and in terms of quantitative and qualitative features. So the skeletal growth needs both structure and material and hormonal regulations. That's why vitamin D has certainly an effect on the osteoid mineralization and also muscular strength and skeletal muscle function and mass, etc. By analogy, we my suppose that the vitamin D deficiency, among other negative factors, environmental factors, might produce a lower peak bone mass. But the question remains open whether it does implicate further risk of fractures, in particular low energy, low impact fractures. We don't know this and the question remains unanswered. Uh, what are the factors linking puberty and vitamin D. If you look at the puberty, it's strongly influenced by ethnicity, climate, latitude, seasonal variations, sun exposure and activity, mechanical loading, nutrition and of course genetic background and our parental, our parents. Uh, whereas vitamin D status alike is also under effect of other impact of the environmental factors, ethnicity, seasonal variations, latitude, nearly the same. So there are many factors overlapping the two categories. Now uh, an essential question about the vitamin D and fractures during growth. The fractures are as common as in adulthood. Actually, the incidence around puberty is very high in boys and girls. And of course, the location of these fractures is different, so the wrist and distal skeleton, peripheral skeleton. And most of these fragility fractures are even not considered osteoporotic, they have another underlying mechanism. However, the question arises is there a link between vitamin D deficiency and fractures during adolescence and puberty? Unfortunately, there is a lack of reliable data and well-designed studies. So published studies do not provide a correct answer. There are some incidental reports, there are many of them, showing some or postulating some association between, between the low vitamin D and stress factor, for example. These authors 
highlight that vitamin D play an important role in the prevention of stress fractures. Do you believe really those fractures were really caused by vitamin D deficiency alone? Uh, in my opinion, it might remain a little bit controversial. Uh, well, this is at least part associated with our approach to vitamin D. The physiology is very clear. This is a natural connection regarding the calcium intake and calcemic role of vitamin D. Vitamin D is considerably responsible for homeostasis, mineral homeostasis and calcium balance. That's right. Whereas when we look at the research, so calcium and vitamin D are usually analyzed separately. That's why, um, based on some previous talks, um, we could state that the studies involved uh, on the effect of calcium and vitamin D might, might be variable, might, might differ, considerably differ, and provide inconsistent results, and that's why we might be a little bit lost. What we need is really just the well-designed, randomized, controlled studies in puberty, which is usually very difficult to perform. Uh, and now, very briefly, a quick overview of the status of the uh, vitamin D in puberty and adolescence. Of course, there are not too much studies showing high level of vitamin D uh, status and the vast majority of them shows the deficiency. The deficiency is common and there are many studies. I will skip the slides very quickly to save the time. Just look, 7,000 people, 9 years, deficiency 30%. And the deficiency was increasing with age, reaching 75% among those aged 11 to 18 years. And another study, our study based on Five, maybe six thousand measurements, and the the proportion of deficiency was also high among those young people, in, including adolescents. Another study, retrospective analysis from my colleague Pavel Pudovsky, that showed that the deficiency was increasing in proportion with age. The older were uh, individuals, the Lower was the status measured, of course, as 25 hydroxy D. Our previous studies has been shown, of course, this included, included the European, uh, the, the review analyzed the status in the Europe, and, which is obvious, of course. That's clear that the latitude has an influence on our outdoor activity and UVB exposure. Uh, a nice, well to send observational study that included also Poland, Ireland, Denmark and Finland showed that both girls and the elderly women demonstrate low vitamin D status. So over one third of the girls had levels below 25, none of all. Almost nearly all of them had less than 50 and the supplementation was beneficial. Nothing new, of course. Our recently published study in the European Journal of Nutrition showed also 700 children, teenagers, that there were seasonal variations. And that's why we concluded that we need to encourage pre-pubertal and pubertal population to modify their lifestyle and to supplement throughout the whole year. Just the, uh, the seasonal variations, this has been shown several times during this, during this conference. An Australian study showed that spring is still a risk, risk factor, seasonal variations and age are considered in many papers. Middle East, retrospective study of 7,000 people from Arab Emirates and the status was also lower in those older children and adolescents. And all of those variables, age was the most significant factor influencing serum. Uh, if very old historical study by, by Michael Holt group, the intake in the United States was very low. There are some associations and between vitamin D status and deficiency and, and morbidity in adolescents, in particular hypertension, triglycerides and, and the risk of cardiovascular diseases. A core, Australian cohort study, the drop of one was one half this population, and if you look at the uh, serum concentration, it decreased with age. A small Polish study, but still quite effectively done, hypervitaminosis D was associated with in obese, with insulin resistance, which is not surprising again. A very 
important study published in pediatrics some 10 years ago stimulated an American Academy of Pediatrics to clearly state we need to put vitamin D back in children and adolescents. So they, they have changed the rules and recommendations actually. There are some specific hazards and the risks in adolescents associated with vitamin D deficiency. Large individual variability, physical development, rapid growth and unpredictable growth velocity. We don't know in, each, in a single individual how fast will the individual grow up. Restrictive diets are quite popular and they might be somehow associated with eating disorders and anorexia nervosa specifically. Increased fracture rate around puberty and uh, compared with childhood. Poor adherence, inadequate compliance, uh, that's why children do not want to take supplements for the vast majority. Um, lifestyle alterations, sedentary lifestyle, avoiding outdoor activity, and finally juvenile pregnancy is not rare. So there are many, the list is pretty long and it shows how many um, um, threatening factors might be involved in the deficiency. What about the recommendations? And there is another confusion again. Uh, first ever question shows is just to home, how, when, how long, and which modality, and finally, how much, what is the dose? If you look at the three guys, yeah, the, the three adolescents, it was some 10 years ago, uh, do they really need vitamin D? Yes, I'm sure. A question arose, are current recommendations enough? Individuals at puberty, according to the recent study published two years ago, are a specific age group demonstrating particular vulnerability to vitamin D deficiency. And the current recommendations are promoting the intake of 10 to 15 micrograms per day might be helpful in preventing the deficiency, which is obvious. However, higher doses might be necessary to ensure the optimal level. And there is, there is a large need of those response studies that could implicate the effectively the, the dose, the dose um, uh, treat to target formula. Uh, so, in other words, we need to hit appropriate time just to prevent deficiency, which is vitamin D supplementation. Just hit at the right time, and maybe we should extend this time of the regular supplementation. And well, there are some clear recommendations like this American one, which shows that healthy adolescents should take 600 per day. And this is the position statement of the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine. And those at risk should take 1,000. And the society tells us that the severe vitamin D deficiency, that means less than 10 nanogram per milliliter, is forces us, or needs mandatory one single dose of 50,000 50, units weekly and then the maintenance dose. Do you think it's really not controversial once weekly 50,000 units for adolescents, girls or boys? I have many doubts and many concerns. The updates, this has been already shown, so the doses are still the same up to 1,000 is safe. If there is obesity, we need to increase the dose on a regular basis, and this is just pragmatic approach. This is an empirical approach, in my opinion. Of course, there is no evidence-based data. So the obese needs, at least healthy obese, needs 2,000 units per day. Upper limit is still the same, nothing changed, and, well, to conclude, there is a little evidence that higher doses are beneficial in adolescents. So further research is needed to precisely determine the exact dose and the exact level, sorry, being specifically positive for skeletal health. And next, the evidence is limited, particularly the non-calcific effects, pleiotropic effects of vitamin D in adolescents and the lack of robust from ERCT, robust results. So, investigators argue that recommendations for target 25 hydroxy concentrations over 75 is a bit too early, it's precocious. So, 
caution is advised in the interpretation of study results, practice guidelines, and, and any published data. That's why in our review paper we, we state clearly need to choose wisely. Now, how to do this is another issue. To summarize, puberty and adolescence are challenging life periods, certainly. In terms of medical care, health care, and compliance, juvenile population shows poor compliance, uh, neglects, different priorities. Implementation of the official recommendations um, from the theory to clinical practice is difficult, particularly in young adults and teenagers. Third, vitamin D deficiency around puberty increases with age, which might, but not must necessarily, implicate increased requirements due to the age-related severity of the deficiency. What I would recommend, just start, start off the supplementation in pre-puberty, otherwise it's, it might be too late. And finally, in adolescent population, an individual, personalized and early preventive approach regarding the needs, the management of vitamin D deficiency and associated health hazards, it is advisable. So personalized, personalized risk assessment is important, in my opinion. Thank you for your attention. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Please, Budlatka, Yakubova, most important.